Good evening, I'm John Beard with the Port Arthur Community Action Network here at the Port Arthur Civic Center. And we are here this evening for a meeting of concerned citizens and others in the community to educate them regarding the proposed Blue Marlin Pipeline, which will carry crude oil from Needleland, Texas, offshore into Louisiana through Lake Sabine and underneath the Natchez River. This is a critical area, environmentally speaking, as well as recreational and culturally speaking. A lot of people's jobs and livelihood depend on this area, plus their properties will be abutted by this. So I and others who are part of the Save Sabine Lake Coalition are here to give information, to help people understand what this project is about, and to also enlist their support as we begin to wait on the environmental impact statement and other federal officials to make a decision on this pipeline. We want to influence that decision, to make our voices heard, and to have an impact. So if you wanted more information about the Blue Marlin Pipeline, go to savesabinelake.com or go to our webpage for the Port Arthur Community Action Network, pacan.com. Thank you.
also expand energy transfers needle in turn to accommodate more oil and release more air pollution by the use of that oil. The company's own data and report shows the risk of a leak. It's likely that its onshore pipeline was filled repeatedly during its lifetime. And they even concede that a major spill in or near Sabine Lake would be utterly devastating to the surrounding environment. Let me give you just a little bit of information on that. Some of my research has said or shows that one quart, those of us are familiar with a quart of oil or a quart of any substance, one quart of oil can spoil or ruin over 250,000 gallons of water. That's the equivalent of an Olympic sized swimming pool of water. And that's something to think about when the pipeline carries that much oil, even if the leak is the size of a pinhead. Pressure is going to take to transport that oil through a volume that's 42 inches wide and then through a 36 inch pipeline over 100 miles offshore and 37 miles onshore. That's a lot of oil, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of oil. And this is a graphic of Blue Orleans oil spill risk. This is their information that they have submitted to the federal government. It's currently under review by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or better known as FERC. And this is what that would look like. Floating oil on the surface of the water. It is color coded, and by the way, we don't have information available. You can look this up and you can see this graphic for yourself. Energy transfer is not to be trusted. Over the last two decades, energy transfer has been among the worst pipeline operators in the country for spills and incidents. From 2002 to 2018, Energy transfer companies reported 527 incidents. That's 16 years, 527 incidents. That's about one incident every 11 days. And for those of you who've been watching and, and keeping up with it, uh, within the last two months, energy transfer has had a spill in the vicinity of Bessie Heights Marsh. These spills cost property owners around one of 111 million in damages and resulted in $5.7 million in penalties from the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, or PHMSA. A company whose pipelines leak, spill, and explode all the time, that's energy transfer. In Pennsylvania, where energy transfer has built another pipeline, charged them with 42 counts of environmental crimes. They were criminally charged for failing to alert authorities to discharges or spills. They were fined millions of dollars by Pennsylvania for numerous failures. An energy regulator in D.C., FERC, has said or concluded that there was a corporate culture here that said the speed justifies the means and that it was all about getting the pipeline done and, it, and that compliance was pretty much an afterthought. In other words, they placed profits getting this pipeline done and making money ahead of protecting the people and protecting the environment. And there's a violation track of parent company uh, summary. The parent company's name, Energy Transfer, the ownership structure, it's a publicly traded company. Its ticker name is EG. It doesn't stand for extraterrestrial either. Uh, it's headquartered in Texas, in Houston, Texas. I'm town. I've been to its headquarters myself. Its major industry is pipelines, its specific industry is pipelines, and the penalty says 2,000 over 596, 596,257,700 dollars. That's over half a billion dollars. Number of re recorded incidents, 316. So they have a very bad track record. Energy transfer chain charged with criminal environmental crimes in Pennsylvania. In October 5th of 2021, in downtown, Downingtown, Pennsylvania, the Attorney General charged Energy Transfer with 46 counts of environmental crimes for their conduct during the construction of the Mariner EC2 pipeline. February 1st of this year, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the Attorney General charged the subsidiary 
of energy transfer with nine counts of environmental crimes related to their conduct during the construction of the Revolution Pipeline. This is taken from Reuters News Agency. Now, just a quick reminder for those of you who fish in Lake Sabine and like to eat fish and sell fish and all, there are a number of fish species that are found in Lake Sabine. You have sea trout, drum, croaker, gulf lindy, bass, bullfish, catfish, snapper, flounder, garfish, skipjack, crabal, kingfish, ladyfish, pufferfish, rayfish, bull sharks, sheepheads, triple tail, and gaff topsail. Good old catfish. You know. <coughs> All of that is in Lake Speed and is under threat. And what do our communities get? You know, we hear it all the time from industry talking about jobs. In this case, there are just a few jobs, only 11, that are going to come from this project. The pipeline can take your land against your will by something called eminent domain and have a permanent easement on your property. It also has a real risk of spills, leaks, and explosions, and they make billions of dollars in profits for selling oil overseas. There might even be talk of, and part of what the information we have is that they talk, people are concerned about the construction, the jobs that will come from it. But we have information that over 80% of those jobs created are not going to be sourced here in Jefferson County. Those people will be brought in. So we're not even going to get those jobs, and those are only temporary jobs. Right. Once the project is over, it's back to what you were doing before. So we're not even going to get the full benefit of that during construction. According to Blue Mall's permit application, there will be 11 permanent positions. Now, this is their information, right? We didn't make this up. It is estimated that 80 to 85% of the workforce will come from outside the project study area. None of the proposed work assignments will require a long-term commitment or require workers to purchase homes in the study area. That's how we build our tax base, industrial taxes, of which these companies don't pay. And also, uh, without buying homes, there's no ad valorem taxes that are going to come from it either. Those people are not located here. They're basically migrant workers. They come in, do the job, and they leave. As discussed, discussed in section 8.3-2, the project will not only add 11 permanent positions, but will also require services from contractors during operations for maintenance and inspection, as well as materials from local vendors. So what can you do? Well, first of all, you need to go to our website, zanesabinelake.com, and get information about that. You can also use the QR code right there, or the QC. QR code? Right, okay, QR code, and it will take you to the petition that we're forming on this and to more information so that you can learn about this pipeline, learn about the effects, look at this information that is submitted by the company itself and then decide for yourself what you're going to do and how you feel about it. And if you decide that this is not a good project or an idea, then one of the things you can do is sign the petition if we want to be circulated. The pipeline company also can use your land against your will by using a process, a legal process called eminent domain. Pipelines are given, are given eminent domain rights. A company has to file a form with the Railroad Commission of Texas declaring that they are common carrier by just checking a box. Just checking a box on the application. The Railroad Commission cannot investigate that status. Wow. So what's important about that is what we call public participation yeah. in trying to be involved and do something about it. And part of that is what we're trying to do here now, to educate and inform the public about their rights and how they can protect their rights and their property. The U.S. Constitution says that the government may take property for a public use as long as just compensation is given to the landowner. The Constitution, the highest law of the land, says the government may, not shall, but may take your property for a public use. This pipeline is not a public use, nor is it in the public's need and necessity, because this pipeline will be going to ship and transport oil overseas not here domestically. And as long as there's just cause, they can do that. 
That's revolutionary defined what that is. Who decides what is just compensation? You're entitled to just compensation, calculated based on the market value of your property. You are entitled to receive the fair market value of the highest and best use to which the property could be reasonably put. You must be provided with the Texas landowner bill of rights. Any entity exercising eminent domain must provide you with a copy. Here's something to remember. If you're approached by this company or any other, do not accept their first offer and do not sign any easement they give you. If anyone comes to you about that regarding your property, the first thing you need to do is, as we say, lawyer up. You need to educate yourself, know your rights, lawyer up if possible, because sometimes this language can be tricky and the pages for these agreements can be quite thick, a lot of paper to read. But there are lawyers that are trained in doing that. That's why I'm so thankful and glad that we have ERPC here to help us with this and to get us this information. But if you want some information on your own, you can check out Texas a and site, Texas Pipeline Easement Negotiation Checklist. The AgriLife Extension has an easement checklist that you can go to online, and you should include the right to damages for construction and et cetera, being on your property, and set specific restoration standards and payment for damages and also define when the easement will terminate or if it's permanent. And there's a lot more things to look for besides that. There's a lot to consider, that's why good to lawyer your own. Will you know how to negotiate with the pipeline's co company's lawyers? Do you know how to calculate your land's highest and best use? Will you be compensated fairly or get taken advantage of? The pipeline company has plenty of lawyers. Or having worked in the industry, they've got whole office buildings with nothing but lawyers that they pay to do this kind of work. Not for your advantage, but for advantage of the company. We are thrilled to offer you a brief presentation from Chris and David Jobs, Texas Eminent Domain Lawyers. They are also available to answer your questions. That will be in about two minutes, five minutes. Okay, so from here, I guess we'll move on a little further. We'll come back to Chris and David. What can you do? Find a lawyer who will represent you. See pipelinecenter.org for this. See the landowner's guide to fighting pipelines, written by landowners threatened with a pipeline in Virginia at pipelinecenter.org. Be connected to other eminent domain threatened landowners, and PRPC can help connect you. Or consider forming an easement action team you can go to pipelinecenter.org for more information. Or offer to speak to a reporter or be quoted in a press release that it's important for your neighbors to know that people are fighting this pipeline. Once again, the key to any of this is education. It's knowledge. Knowledge is power. And when someone has more knowledge and power than, than, than you to be able to get what they want, they will use that power to your disadvantage. So you have to arm yourself as much as you can with the necessary information you need to protect your rights. The company is not there to represent or protect you. They're there to make money. Take action now. We have four stations set up. One, to map your community and identify important areas along the pipeline route or corridor. Two, send a comment to MARAD during the comment period and record the comment. You can record that comment now. The comment period hasn't opened yet. I don't think it has opened yet. Uh, that's a part of their public participation that they announce this and, and try to publicize it, which they don't do a very good job of. But well, we're going to try to help you with that. That's why we had you sign in. We can inform you, let you know when that is, so you can give them your two cents and let them know how you feel. Or you can write a letter to your government leaders, not only to the Federals in Washington, but to those in Austin with the Railroad Commission, or even your county commissioners, or even your city council. They too need to be aware of this and know that you have rights and you're going to protect them, regardless of what they do. They're not the end of the line in this fight to protect your rights. And also tell all of your neighbors and host a gathering in your home or in your neighborhood or at a park and talk about this. We'll be glad to have people come in and talk with you and help you and give you information on this. Okay, any 
questions? Yes, ma'am. So the channel is out. I did the last year the 87 special legislation and uh, is the only half of uh, and the only some changes that were done by the representative Joe yesterday. So I'll make sure you all I think it's called House Bill 2732. And I, I don't I I thought the governor signed it, but I haven't kept up completely on it. Uh, that bill to look into that and see if that bill did pass, if it did pass, uh, if it is indeed a win-win, because I hate to say it myself, but sometimes what's a win for them is not necessarily a win for you. Kind of reminds me of what we say about compromise. One of my, I guess you say, uh, being a former city councilman here in Fort Arthur, one of my mentors taught me that compromise is all about who's going to give up what and who's going to get what. But we sometimes think that we're doing ourselves a favor by sitting down and talking through it and working through it. But we end up finding out that we gave up far more than what we probably could have. That's why I earlier said, don't take the first deal that's off. Let me tell you a story of what happened with the pipeline that uh, came to Port Arthur on the West End. Uh, it was going out of the corridor. You know, in the pipeline corridor, there's a certain procedure you go through. By the way, I have to serve on the city's pipeline committee that deals with that, citizens committee. And one of the problems that we had was these pipeline companies come in and they go and knock on your door, and they talk to the landowner, and they make them an offer. And a lot of time in some areas and communities, for someone to sit down to the table and talk with you and open that briefcase and pull out the check and go to the city there and say, you know, here's what we're willing to offer you, and will you accept it? That can be a lot of pressure sometimes, especially when you've got bills to pay, or when you're behind on a mortgage, or when you have needs to do something for yourself or your family. And a lot of times people decide and, and, and be taken advantage of it, not seek any kind of legal advice or guidance or even know what it is they're signing. So it's important, as we said earlier, to lawyer up because these companies are working and operating in their behalf to address their bottom line, just to make money. Not there to help you. They're there to get the job done, and they're gonna do it for the cheapest amount possible. So you gotta protect your rights, you gotta know your rights, you gotta get some help in. But thank you anyway, Pat. We need to look into that and see just what effect that bill has and how it's going to actually work, especially in a case like this. Any other questions? Yes, Mary. Um, with energy transfers, the pipelines, it's not a matter of if there's going to be a fair fair when it's going to happen. Um, has anyone done any, put any numbers as an economic evaluation of what That's a good question. I don't know if anyone has, but I think some of the information we saw, if you go back to uh, some of the other screens earlier, showing what a spill would look like, uh, there's ways to calculate it, but it would probably be immeasurable. When you look at the oyster beds that would be disturbed there, when you look at not having the ability to fish or use the recreational use of that land, you know, there's a term that they call having the, the use of your property for your own pleasure. Well, this is public property. This is something that we all take advantage of and can cherish. And then two people fish and make their living from this. You know, there's still guys that shrimp out the lakes of Bean and, and catch fish for sale and, and whatever. So if that's disturbed, what's that loss going to do to their way of making a living? Or what is it going to do to our quality of life if we can't use that lake anymore or have problems with that? We're not trying to sell boom and doom here. We're just looking at the reality of it. The reality is this company has a poor track record. And the state of Texas, through its uh, railroad commission, does a very poor job of monitoring and overseeing these pipelines and also when there are penalties and incidents of making sure that these companies pay their, not fair share, but pay for what they did. And unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is the taxpayer is on the hook for it because the companies don't find ways to get around it and use legal lease and have these agreements, and they don't pay as much as they should to fix this problem. So once again, it begs the question, to what purpose are we doing this? Is it going to help and benefit the 
It was the at-large. You know, you say jobs, but those jobs are going to come and go like that. What after that? And what if, you know, when I was in working in the refinery, and I worked for Exxon Mobil 38 years, and one of the things we talked about in safety is to ask yourself, what if? If I do something, what if? What if this happens? What if it doesn't work out quite like I see or think it is? And we've had too many times in cases where things have happened that way. You saw the picture of the pipeline that just opened up and ruptured, 60 foot lift ruptured, just like someone split the pipeline right over. So those are things we have to be concerned about. And the question, it makes the question, who oversees that? Who makes sure that the company uses proper materials and proper standards, that the welds are correct, that the metal thickness is correct, that it's protected if it's in a salty environment? Yes, that's grinding water that we got out there. So there are a number of questions. We have to ask those questions. And that's why public participation is so important. Yes. Right now, it's in the hands of the person. <coughs> I'll let you speak to that, if you will. Oh, sure, no, I'm just going to say, um, uh, FERC, FERC regulates interstate, like going through different states' gas pipelines, so they don't regulate this as a pipeline. Because the oil is being exported, they do have to have something to do with it, but the permitting agency is MARA, which is the U.S. Maritime Administration, uh, that is headed by Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, and it's overseen by Pete Buttigieg <coughs> and the Department of Transportation. So we've got a letter writing table over there if you want to write to them and uh, tell them we've even got a little form letter that makes it really easy for you to figure out. And I just went back to this slide because this is their own words. It's likely that its onshore pipeline will spill repeatedly during its lifetime. Like, they're saying that. Like, we're not even saying that. And I wanted to speak for a second about the eminent domain because people say, you know, they're going to make you this offer. And, but then when they come, they, the land agents who come to you, they have no responsibility to tell the truth. It's not in the law anywhere. They can tell you whatever they want to tell you. They can say, you know, I don't know why you're not going to say yes because all of your neighbors have already signed. And that is usually 100% false. But they can tell you whatever. Their, their job is to get you to sign. And they'll say anything. And then, and then they'll come at you, they'll come ask you the second time or the third time if you say no to the first offer. And then they'll say, well, we're gonna sue you for eminent domain. We're gonna take you to court and we're gonna get your property anyway. So it's really important that you have somebody on your side. And so we briefly talked about how at pipelinecenter.org <coughs> we have a list. We worked with uh, some folks in DC and we came up with a list, we vetted uh, 16 lawyers all around the country uh, who work on eminent domain. And by the way, this is a really important point. Eminent domain lawyers work on a contingency basis, which means you're not giving them any money up front. I mean, any lawyer will do an initial consultation for free. But even if they take your case, what they get paid on is the difference between the initial offer they gave you and the offer that the lawyer got for you, the, the last offer. And that's all that you owe them. So, you know, don't get all worried, like, oh, I, I don't have the money to hire a lawyer. Well, they're doing it on the contingency that you get more money for this. And if you don't have a lawyer read all of these, we've seen easements that people sign, and, you know, they don't read all the stuff. It basically says that, you know, the pipeline company gets to have this easement forever. And that means, you know, you can't have your children or your grandchildren, like, that easement keeps going. And they can sell it to somebody else. Right. That's what happened in the Atlantic Coast Pipeline in Virginia. The people who got <coughs> easements for them, that project got canceled. Canceled. But did the company return the easements? No. They're keeping them. They have those easements. They could sell them to somebody else. And that means that they have your property to use to put the pipeline there. You're still paying your property tax, of course, because it's your property. But there's certain things you can't do with it, like you can't drive a track, or anything heavy over it because it could damage the pipeline. So they're telling you what you can do with your property. Uh, you know, they're giving you peanuts. Yes. Uh, do we have a number of how many private individuals are going to be impacted by the pipeline? Um, there is. Do we have their names and addresses? 
Well, there is a list, but so far they've said um, some of the. They're not following right away already. No, I mean there's there's no there's no right away for this one. The one that exists underwater, that's that's there already. But there's like the no one there's no. Sunoco, there's pipe. They just put a new pipeline, several of them, right down Twin City Highway, and. The ones going down uh, the other road to Fort Nature, all the way almost to the park. It would be nice if they followed a right of way. I mean, you'll you'll see. I'm sure they are because they're going to the same plan. Well, yeah, but they. So they there must be some pro a list of property owners that are going to be. In yeah, they property. absolutely have a list, but they're not sharing it with us. Really? They don't make it public. In fact, there was a suit but you know the last route. year. But you do know the route. Yeah, they, we know the route, and so we've been so going out and talking to them. So then you know the property yeah. owner. Right. Well, you're this map right. over here, it's zoomed in to Bridge City, and you'll see they have uh, two temporary and one permanent work roads that they're putting in right through that community, like right down the street. And that means they can do whatever they want there. There's work areas, they have trucks. Like when, I know when they were building the Permian Highway pipeline up in the Hill Country, they, they work seven days a week. They start at 6 a.m., the trucks come rolling through. So I mean, that's what you're talking about in your community. Any other eminent domain questions?
any uh, consumption in, in the United States. It was all going to be ship, shipped to other countries. And, and based in large part on that, we were able to get that project shut down. Um, the, the issue of, of whether something's a public use is usually a tricky thing for landowners to win on, though. And a lot of times companies will do you know, some little thing. There was a, a, a pipeline here in Texas that was really meant to pipe in product down into Mexico, but what they did was they just created a little uh, tap close to, in a couple places close to the border and said that, that that was enough to justify this massive project, the, the fact it was going to help a couple tiny little communities, you know, not really communities as much as just not cities or towns, they were just little neighborhoods that were kind of on the border and they, they were crafty enough to figure out a way to make that a public use. And so the issue of public use is usually a hard thing for landowners to win on, but if you win, that can potentially shut down the whole project. So that's, you know, as things develop more, that's definitely something to look at. The second thing to, to talk about is, is just compensation. You know, the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution and um, Article 1, Section 17 of the Texas Constitution say that we that a landowner whose land is taken for public use has to be given just compensation and usually that's measured in terms of market values did you figure out what the value of your property was before the pipeline and what the value is after the pipeline but something that pipeline companies will tend to do is they'll say hey if your land is worth ten thousand dollars an acre let's say and we're taking two acres and all we owe you is, is $20,000, even if you've got like a, a 20 acre piece of property. So they, they'll say, hey, we're just taking two of your 20 acres. We only need to pay you um, 20,000 bucks, you know, 10,000 an acre for your property. But are we in a, a position here where, where you, can, you can tell me what's wrong with that calculation? Anybody, anybody got the ability to, to tell me what's wrong with what the pipeline company just did? It's a one-time payment for something that's going to be there for the rest of your life. It's a one-time And it's going to mess up the other acreage. What's, it, what's exactly. the impact on the other Yes, acreage? yes, yes, yes. That's it, right? What about your other 18 acres? Are people going to pay you as much for the remaining 18 acres that you've got? Are they going to pay, like if you had to sell your 20 acres it's got this pipeline easement through it, it's one thing to say, hey, you know, it really only messes up two acres, but that's not the truth. Usually a pipeline easement, if somebody knows that you've got a pipeline coming through it, they're going to say, hey, this is going to impact the whole value of my whole property, of my entire 20 acres. And, and so don't let, don't let them fool you on that. That's a, a very, very common practice for pipeline companies is that they'll say, we'll pay you, uh, we might even pay you $15,000 an acre, even though your land's only worth $10,000 an acre for the two acres that we're putting the easement on. But, but that doesn't come anywhere close to compensating people in most cases, most pipeline cases that I've seen for the impact that it has on the remaining land. So, and, and, and what are some of the issues that come up? Why are people willing, not wanting to pay so much if you've got an easement on it? Well, one is that you've got a loss of privacy. These, the, the pipeline operator, other people can come onto it and um, they, can, they can tell you that, that, you know, they can say, hey, we're just on to inspect the pipeline or make uh, changes to it or, you know, uh, repairs to it. So you lose your privacy. Another is if you ever need to cross the pipeline with the road or with utilities, you, you've got a development partner now. You've got to deal with the pipeline company as your development partner going forward. And they, they usually have the right to be able to, to um, tell you whether you're able to cross their pipeline with utilities or roads or, or things like that. You might have a situation too where the, maybe the pipeline easement kind of strands a chunk of your property now you can't get easy access to it anymore and so you lose the entire value of that you know we we tended to see that the pipeline takings 
on the low end can, can impact the remaining value of your property anywhere from 5% on the low end, 5 to 10% on the low end, up to you know 45 or 50% in some, in some cases even more than that on the total value of your remaining property. It's impacted that much. And so if, in, say a case, in a case where it impacted your, your value, say 50%, if you had a land, a piece of land that's worth, you know, Three hundred thousand dollars, and now it's only, it, it may only be worth one hundred fifty or one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars after that after that pipeline taking. There's a kind of a two-step process in Texas. You, you 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 go through if it's a you know a FERC federal process is, is one way. You'll typically be in federal court, and it kind of all goes together as kind of one piece. It's a lawsuit. If you're in Texas state court, though, it, it has two phases. You've got a special commissioner's phase, which, and when they talk about special commissioners, those are just three people that the judge appoints that who own land in your county who get to decide, kind of like administrative judges, how much your property's worth. They don't get to decide whether the taking happens or not. They just get to decide how much it's worth in, in a little administrative trial. Either side can object to that, and then you go and you, you, you become a defendant in an actual lawsuit. And you know, through that process, this is a, a little bit of a tricky area of law, and so it's really helpful that you find a, an eminent domain attorney, somebody who represents landowners in pipeline cases on a consistent basis to make sure that you navigate that process and get the best result possible. So, I, and I know that, that, that all of us care about being good stewards of the land that we've been given, and my, my deep belief is that you're gonna do better off by finding somebody who's in your corner and help advise you on that, help maximize your chances of shutting down the project entirely or getting the maximum compensation possible. So with that, I will pause and uh, 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 turn, it, turn it back over to the people in charge there. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Does anyone have any questions on that?
we need to start making a lot of loud noise about don't let this in our guys environment. That's why it's important to talk to your neighbors. If you just draw a straight line, you'll know right where the pipeline's coming in. If they don't tell, you can tell your neighbor. Well, the people that I live by aren't going to be by the, by the pipeline, but it's going to impact all the birds and the fish and a whole lot of other stuff. I, I personally think that that would be a disaster to put that in there. Well, I don't think they ought to run pipelines through things like that anyway. Any oh, there's already several. Oh, I know. They've been putting them in there since I was a little child. Just to answer your about what we want, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily what, what we want, it's what the community wants, or what, is it what everybody wants, um, and it really is a community discussion about what is the desired outcome here. Um, there's different things that can be done uh, in order to determine what that desired outcome is. Um, and we have different um, stations set up in the back um, to kind of have those conversations. Um, so one of the first things that we can do is to map uh, the community in important areas. So there in the back, um, there's different maps and there's little stickers. So we encourage each person to take a sticker and put, uh, and it's a smiley face. So um, take the smiley face and map an area that makes you happy. Where is your happy place? Whether it's where your home is, whether it's a specific spot on the lake, whether it's somewhere um, in the Pesky Heights Marsh. Um, just take a second to kind of reflect on this area and, and community and where a, a place is that, that brings you happiness, right? And thinking about the potential impact that the pipeline could have. Um, and that's a space to talk to each other about those areas. Um, the second station that we have in the back is a letter writing station. So we talked about how right now the um, MAYRAD is doing an environmental impact uh, study, and so they're gonna be reviewing the comment period, or they're gonna be opening up the comment period once that statement um, is released. And so they're gonna be taking into consideration all of the comments and opinions that you have. So this would be a great time to kind of write down what your concerns are, what your opinion is about the pipeline. Um, again, you can talk to other people at the, at the table and we have a template for you to make it a little bit easier. Um, and then the, the next station is um, with our friend in the back with the camera, um, where you can actually speak your mind. You can say what your opinion is, what are your thoughts, um, do you want the pipeline, do you not want the pipeline, are you concerned about it, what are your concerns? Um, I'll ask you a few questions to kind of prompt you. Um, and then the last station is the station where um, if you want to inform other community members about this project, if you want to talk to your friends and your neighbors and um, your church members, uh, just kind of having a conversation about what that looks like and how you can kind of help inform other people if you feel like this is something that you want to let other people know about. Um, so we have around 30 minutes left. So I encourage people just to go to whatever station they are most interested in. And well, what is people. the comment period? What's the date on that? So What's it the has not date? opened yet. Um, there's there's kind of a, a veil that's difficult to, to get through. There's not the information isn't very transparent. We we're um, we have a whole team of people that are constantly checking the federal register to see when they post yeah, that. We, once. Our group has already sent in comments, Parks and Wildlife, uh, Corps of Engineers, That's the great. What's uh, your group? Marine, uh, Clean Air Board. Oh, that's and great. And we've already sent those comments in, but uh, if this is another comment period, we need to be part of that too. Yeah, the, yeah. the comment period gets triggered once the environmental yeah, impact, impact statement is released. Is so released. the company has to give them that, and then they will say, now we're going to open a 30-day comment period. And we're going to let everybody know right. um, through the sign-up sheet. Everybody that signed in, yeah. we'll, we'll let, let everybody know, know once we'll that comment period is open. Yeah. Our email yeah. too. Okay. Yeah. So you yeah. have all that, and um, that will be very useful. Yeah, absolutely. So I invite everyone to get up and go to a station. Don't forget, we've got t-shirts that are free if you want them, yard signs if you want any yard signs. 
And there's pizza and drinks, so everybody grab some food and write a letter. For their big petitions. Yes. Um, they're, the one that they put out, that's the Sierra Club has a petition that they started. You can put that QR code back up that goes to their petition, the petition, well, petition like or you can just Google it and see. Find it on Sierra Club. I think you should go to the So they're going to just help with that petition, but it's not uh, native species. The black rail, um, where they found the habitat for the black rail, is where common work wants to build. We want everybody out of here, and we won't have any more Southwest Louisiana and Southeast Texas will all be wiped off if, if they continue to, you know, run this pipeline and build all these projects. Imagine what 10 projects proposed in Southwest Louisiana, plus what's proposed in Southeast Texas. We're less than 30 minutes away from the no, there's already plenty of pipelines out there in existence that can be used dually. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, well, you know, the pipeline is going to hit a connection to go. There's offshore. already, there's already one. Um, there's several of them going offshore. Well, I saw the one that you're pipeline. talking about. Well, you know, the one that's coming down Twin City and then part of yeah. 366. Yes. That ends up at that facility over there that they're using to offload those tanks. Good evening. My name is Christopher Jones. Uh, C H R I S. J O N E S. Uh, I'm from Beaumont, Texas. I live in the South End Chalk Pollard neighborhood. Uh, today I attended the, um, as you see, stop the pipeline and save um, um, Bessie Heights Marsh. Uh, the Blue, uh, Blue Marlin Pipeline. I do apologize, um, but I learned a lot of information today with especially about the pipeline proposal. Uh, I would like to uh, address to those that have the power to approve and or um, disapprove this pipeline. My uh, sentiment to, to you is to please, on behalf of not only myself from Beaumont, but residents of Louisiana as well, we ask that, that you um, that you would please not approve this proposal to do a pipeline right through what a lot of us consider to be our lifeline, especially for sea life and wildlife. Um, again, this pipeline has a lot of drawbacks uh, to humans uh, and and their ways of life as well as their qualities of life uh, and I would hope that uh, our representatives uh, in DC uh, in Austin Texas in Jefferson County and in the Tri-City area Beaumont Port Arthur or Orange or the Golden Triangle like we like to call it uh, would would take action against these types of um, threats to human life here in Southeast Texas. Again, we say no to Blue Marlin Pipeline and we say yes to preserving life, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Ariana Quarry and I was born and raised here in Southeast Texas. I'm from Nederland, which is actually where the Blue Marlin Pipeline is going to go through. Um, and actually my neighborhood was already partially destroyed by an energy transfer partners pipeline. Um, and whenever that happened, I didn't know anything about eminent domain or what that means, about how companies can just take your land basically and pay you what they deem to be a just and fair price without taking into account um, you know, what it means to people who live there, what it means to the whole neighborhood, to the whole community. So it was really great tonight getting to see the presentation by John, um, John Beard and his um, team, I'm sorry, I don't know their names, um, and hearing about all of their information about eminent domain laws and pipelines and about the environmental impact um, about the Blue Marlin pipeline because, you know, being a native of this place, um, I really love and cherish the Sabine and just hearing that it may put all of our local wildlife and, you know, the fish at risk is really heartbreaking. So, you know, stop, stop, stop the, stop the Blue Marlin pipeline. Um, yeah, thanks so much to John Beard and everyone.